Uh, many of you from very far distances. We uh, are grateful for your safe travel uh, to get here today. At the beginning of every Midwest uh, CPAC meeting, uh, we want to ensure that all of our speakers uh, disclose any financial relationships they have to the healthcare industry. So every member of our Midwest CPAC uh, panel uh, who is present today has met the ICER conflict of interest policy. Um, I've asked a, question, a quick question of our panel, uh, ICER panel Midwest CPAC members, have there been, are there any updates to the um, any updates to your conflict of interest in the last, okay, hearing none, that's great. So I'd like to just quickly uh, introduce our panel members, and then we'll get the program uh, started for today. Um, as I said, my name is Eric Armbrick. I'm a professor um, in the St. Louis University Center for Health Outcomes Research. Um, we also have Aaron Carroll, uh, who is a professor of pediatrics at Indiana University uh, School of Medicine. Uh, we have Reem Mustafa. Uh, who is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Uh, Harold Pollack, uh, the Helen Ross professor at the University of Chicago. Rachel Sachs, an associate professor of law at uh, Washington University uh, in St. Louis. <coughs> Shumei Yen, who's the former or previous uh, state, chronic state chronic disease uh, epidemiologist for the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. She's also affiliated with the University of Missouri School of Medicine. Paul Heinrich uh, is uh, the California, uh, kind of the equivalent to CPAC, uh, the Midwest CPAC in California, and a professor and vice chair for quality uh, clinical affairs and analytics at Stanford University. Um, from New England, uh, we have Rob uh, Asseltine, sorry, a professor and chair, Division of Behavioral Sciences uh, at the University of Connecticut. Um, we have uh, Claudio uh, Galatari, uh, Associate State Director of Advocacy for AARP in the Connecticut uh, State Office. Brian Sullivan, uh, also from New England, a professor of pediatrics at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College. And Edward Westrick, a New England CPAC member also, Director of the Community Partnerships for New England, the American Diabetes Association. I believe Austin Frank is also here. Sorry about that, Austin, I've skipped over you. Um, he's a health economist uh, from the Department of VA and also a member of the New England CPAC. So we're thrilled uh, here in Kansas City to bring together um, some members of our uh, New England CPAC as well as the Midwest uh, group uh, for this uh, exciting uh, discussion today um, uh, on the, a fascinating topic. We have three uh, guest or policy roundtable participants. We'd also like to introduce, so I'm going to go over here to, uh, to Caitlin, to Christine, and Janet, if you could provide a brief introduction for yourself, that would be great this morning. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, sure. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. Good morning, everyone. I am Janet Lebrecht, and I am here representing um, issues and thoughts uh, regarding the rehabilitation community and the potential impact and other uh, considerations that should be uh, brought to forefront today in this discussion. I am the former commissioner under the Obama administration uh, for the Rehabilitation Services Administration. Thank you, and welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Kay. I'm a um, MD. I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon from Gainesville, Florida. Um, I started my clinical practice at University of Florida as an assistant professor with a Foundation Fighting Blindness Career Development Award. So I was doing AAV therapy and basic science research with gene therapy on a different disease, on achromatopsia, but I have some knowledge in the basic science and AAV development and vector optimization. Um, and I developed a clinical trial practice in, uh, in inherited retinal diseases, so I'm a, a you know, relatively large referring base to my site. I've now moved into private practice in Gainesville, Florida, but I have a large database of patients with inherited retinal dystrophies, of course, including LCA and retinitis pigmentosa and other diseases. I'm actively involved in multiple clinical trials, um, some of which for gene therapy, some of which for oral drugs, for, retinite, um, for inherited retinal diseases. And again, I have several patients who um, have this disease that we're going to be talking about today, RP65 mediated disease, um, and have navigated them through some of these clinical trials. And now, as we go into commercialization. And Caitlin, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Corey. I am a patient with RPE65 who received the Verotagene Neprovovac gene therapy as part of the phase three clinical trial. That's great. Thank you, and thank you for coming. So I'm going to turn the uh, the time and the agenda I can go to, uh, to Stephen, right. who uh, will get us started on um, on the program for today. Thank you. Good morning. I'm just going to offer a, a brief introduction and thank you again to those of you who've um, traveled to Kansas City um, or who are watching um, over the webcast. 
Um, today represents um, a milestone in many different ways, so we're very happy to have you participating in, in the meeting today. So we'd like to start off with a brief um, reflection on why we're here, why we're having this public meeting, what's the purpose, um, what's the, the kind of the impetus for having these kinds of meetings. Um, in this case, um, it's quite clear that visual impairment and blindness can profoundly affect the lives of patients and their families <clears throat> and the broader community. Um, we, we thought this statement from Laura Manfrey that was given as part of the FDA Advisory Committee um, was, was helpful. I'm just going to just read it to you. It says, we hear from families whose children cannot make eye contact with their own parents and the devastating impact it, is, it has on the child and the entire family. We hear from kids who face social and academic challenges that range from bullying and exclusion to being perceived as less intelligent, when the only difference they struggle with is that they cannot see as well as their sighted peers. Even in the best of circumstances, they are growing up with a tremendous pressure that most of us never had to, that they will someday live in a world of complete darkness. The emotional, social, and educational toll of this vision loss at a young age is tremendous. So we acknowledge and you know, in our work at ICER, when we reach out and begin to work with the patient and the kind of broader community, um, this is a very important perspective of why we're here today. Uh, visual impairment and blindness um, has a profound impact in many cases on the lives of, of individuals. We're also here today because Veretta Gene, uh, this treatment, represents a true scientific milestone. It's the first treatment approved in the United States in which a new working copy of a gene is inserted into the cells of patients with a specific genetic disorder to treat that condition. So it represents, indeed, the kind of scientific milestone that people will be noting, I'm sure, for, for years to come. Now, as with other paradigm-shifting um, innovations, um, the introduction of Vereta gene will raise important questions about its appropriate use, about its pricing, and about the way that insurers, both public and private, um, bring it into, um, into coverage. We also know that for some treatments, especially those for very small patient populations, they can raise particular issues about the types of studies, the types of evidence that are reasonable, that are feasible um, to be done and ultimately the relationship of pricing to the size of the population. <coughs> so uh, for ICER and for the CPAC, this is uh, one of the first um, uh, conditions and the first treatments that we will be looking at under the rubric of the treatment for an ultra-rare disease. Now gene therapies, which won't all be for ultra-rare conditions, um, but in general they will heighten because of their um, uh, prominent uh, kind of use as one-time treatments in particular, they may heighten concerns about the affordability of emerging treatments, especially under existing paradigms of pricing and payment. And um, you know, ICER has worked with providers, uh, with uh, payers, and with manufacturers and other innovators um, to think about you know gene therapy and the ultra-rare disorder kind of uh, landscape. And uh, you know, one thing just to keep in mind is that approximately 1% uh, of the total population, um, if, which represents about 10% of those with a rare, an ultra-rare condition, if 1% uh, of the population were treated um, at a, a price of a million dollars, the, the cost overall to the health system would rise to three trillion. Now that's not a figure that would ever come all at once. But it's, it's something that many policymakers do have in mind when they're starting to think about how we conceptualize value for treatments, how we think about their pricing and payment. Um, there are a lot of issues to keep in mind about the affordability for the healthcare system in the US. And it's not just the healthcare system, obviously. This affects individuals and families. Um, there's been a new effort to try to figure out how to quantify affordability um, for different uh, kind of stakeholders. This is one that was uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's an affordability index for families, and it just traces the kind of percent of the health care premium for insurance as it relates to overall family income. And you can see that over the years, it peaked, in a way, around 2011, at least for now, but it's risen above 30 percent. 
That means that the average household, the cost for the insurance to cover them is a, over a third of their household income, or about a third. So this, this does prevent, obviously, stresses for individuals, for families, and for the broader healthcare system. So we're here today because we feel that it's really important to try to get questions right for patients today and patients of the future. We need to figure out how to bring treatments like this into the healthcare system in a way that will maintain sustainable access to care for everybody, both today and in the future. Uh, we feel that there's a benefit, therefore, to independent evaluation of the evidence on both clinical effectiveness and value, and to have that brought into the public domain, because we need to do that to engage the public, to explore things as objectively as we can, and to link it to ways of thinking of innovative pricing and payment uh, approaches, again, that can link in a way with the innovative science that we're getting um, to make sure that these treatments are brought in in a way that can benefit patients. So you've, you've been introduced to the members of the Midwest CPAC. They are an independent appraisal committee, as you noted, uh, made up of clinicians with expertise in evidence-based medicine, methodologists, and individuals who represent the broader patient and public perspective. We, the, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, convene these public hearings, and we do the background um, academic work, if you will, the scientific work, to develop a review of the evidence and to present it in this kind of setting. So I want to tell you a little bit more about ICER. In terms of our funding, you'll see an updated slide here for 2018 that the majority of our overall funding, and this is available on our website, comes from nonprofit foundations, and that's the funding that we use for our reports and for our public meetings. The leading foundations within that are the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the Blue Shield of California Foundation. We also do take about 19, 20 percent of overall revenue for a separate policy summit program. Um, and you can see that those involve contributions from both manufacturers and um, payers in the health system. And we have a small set of government contracts. So how was the report generated that serves as the kind of foundation for the discussion today? Briefly, we start with a scoping phase at the very beginning in which we reach out to the broader patient community um, and other stakeholders, clinical experts and others, and the manufacturers to get their guidance on how to conduct a review that will answer the key questions about effectiveness and value that will be most germane to different stakeholders. We then do an evidence analysis, a systematic review of the available evidence, and we do cost-effectiveness modeling to try to uh, bring that perspective around value into the discussion. We go through several cycles of public comment and revision, and we also have official uh, clinical expert report reviewers, who for this report were Stephen Russell and Byron Lamb. So within this broader scope, we then produce a report, and I just want to briefly present the conceptual background to the way the report is structured. It, it begins really with the goal of how we want to think about evidence to achieve sustainable access to high-value care for all patients. And we believe that decision makers, policy makers, uh, the health system in general needs to think about that goal by concentrating on two major components. One is long-term value for money of different care options, and the other is short-term affordability. And you can see that long-term value for money itself is a concept that has different important domains within it. It starts with thinking about the comparative clinical effectiveness of different care options. It includes incremental cost effectiveness, which is a long-term perspective. Other benefits or disadvantages, which I know we'll spend a lot of time uh, concerned with today, these are things that might not be captured in the clinical data or even in the cost effectiveness modeling. And contextual considerations, which often include social and ethical values that decision makers may wish, may wish to think seriously about um, in many contexts. And then separately, we consider short-term affordability by looking at an analysis of the potential budget impact and whether that potential might raise specific tension within the health system around short-term affordability. Now, importantly, this, as I mentioned, is the first treatment that is being evaluated as part of a broader modification 
of the ICER value framework that you just saw to specifically adapt its approach for treatments of ultra-rare disorders. And there are a couple of key features of that that I wanted to highlight. One is that in our report, and I'm sure in the discussion today, there will be additional context around the potential evidence limitations that are sometimes found with these treatments. Limitations that can derive again from very small patient numbers, other features that might make it difficult to do certain kinds of trials, or to gain the kinds of certainty around long-range outcomes that other treatments might, might have. The report includes a broader range of cost-effectiveness results to kind of generate further thinking about the thresholds that might be used to think about value in these kinds of contexts. And we present our cost-effectiveness results incorporating broader societal costs alongside the traditional analyses of health system costs as part of incremental cost-effectiveness. Now we do note also in all our reports that decision makers for treatment, when they're making decisions around funding, coverage, pricing, around treatments for ultra-rare disorders, they often give special weight to additional benefits and con broader contextual considerations when making those decisions. So there's a pattern of that that some people feel reflects societal values or other features of the health system, and we want to make sure that at least people understand that context um, in, the, uh, in reading our report and in the context of today's meeting. So the way we'll run the agenda for today is that after this phase, then we will have about an hour in which we'll have a presentation of the evidence from Dr. Reiner Banken and from Dr. Marita Zimmerman. Then during that phase, we'll have the chance for the, the, the CPAC to engage in discussion, uh, questions of that, and we have clinical experts and patients available to help um, uh, reflect on the evidence um, during this phase. Then we'll have a, a session when the manufacturer will be able to make a public comment and there'll be further discussion back and forth with the ICER uh, scientific team and with the council. Then we'll have lunch that will be either around 11.30, 11.45. We'll come back to start at 12.45 with a series of votes in which we'll have further deliberation. Um, the experts and patient uh, and community representatives will be at the front table so that the, the, the deliberation and votes will happen then, following which we'll have a policy roundtable where payers, um, clinical experts, patients, um, and we in the broader community, will, again, we'll talk explicitly about how the evidence might be translated best into clinical practice, into patient education and engagement, into future research, into coverage in those broader issues. We'll have a final reflection and wrap-up phase from the CPAC and adjourn uh, probably before 4 o'clock today. All right. With that, I will <coughs> turn the chair, the, the gavel, so to speak, the virtual gavel back over to the chair, and I will introduce uh, Dr. Reiner Banken, who will kick off with a presentation of the comparative clinical effectiveness information. I will be providing you with an evidence, an overview of the, of the evidence. I'm based in Montreal, Canada, and I did some consulting work in the Canadian context with patient organizations, industry, and government. I have none of this work involved uh, eye diseases or any products of, of Spark. The key review members for this part is Jerry Kramer, Patricia Sinnott, and David Rind. So we are talking about inherited retinal diseases, which are an important cause of childhood blindness, and overall they affect around one in every 2,300 people. It's a group of genetic diseases that's usually caused by recessive mutations. And over the last 20 years, an increasing number of causal genes have been identified. Overall, inherited retinal diseases are one of the most genetically diverse groups of inherited disorders. So now we are talking about the RPE65 gene. So this is one of the, I think, nearly 200 genes that have been identified as being associated with these inherited retinal disorders. What the gene does, it produces a protein, an enzyme, that's 
needed for the regeneration of the proteins in the, in, in the retina. So in the eye, you've got the light coming in that's being uh, uh, translated into an electric impulse. And in order for this cycle to work, you need this, this enzyme, especially for the, for the rods I'm going to talk this about later. So you've got different diseases, different manifestations that are caused by mutations in this gene. And you need genetic testing to identify patients who have this, have mutations in this gene. All over, there is an estimation that between 1,000, maybe up to 3,000 persons in the United States do have this, this mutation. So this is an ultra rare disease, and as Steve mentioned, the framework for ultra rare diseases, the modifications were used in, in our report. The presentation of the persons who, who are having the mutation, it's a progressive loss with, of vision with severe visual impairment that can start at birth, can start during childhood, and it, it leads to complete vision loss in early adulthood. But we will see this later. There's a great variability in the presentations uh, of, uh, of this disease and patients who have this mutation. There are no therapies currently available that alter the natural history of the disease. So when we are talking about regular care, it's, it's supportive care. There is no treatment currently, currently available. This is a, 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 a figure from 70 individuals who had biallelic mutations in this gene. So 70 individuals they comprise the 41 patients who have received retrogene either in the phase one or the phase three trials. So what you're seeing is a, is a range of diseases when the gene is, is present on both copies of the, of the DNA. It can cause these diseases which have a more early onset with the LCA, you see 42%, or a more late onset. And it's, it's not only the mutation that's responsible <coughs> for the presentation. It is some other factors we, we don't understand yet. So by, by age 18, 90% of the individuals have a definite diagnosis but it, it takes time to arrive at this diagnosis. The, I think, please, all along the presentation, keep in mind the great variability in presentations. I think this is one of the essential features of these, these, these mutations. So what is happening? What is the disease process as far as we, as we know it? And Dr. K is here late in the discussion to provide extra points I may not know about or may not cover. So you may remember from high school biology that in the eye you've got rod photoceptors and you've got cone photoceptors. So the cone photoceptors are in the center of the eye and they are responsible for the visual acuity and the color vision. They need a certain level of light to be activated. <coughs> The more uh, sensitive photoceptors are the rod photoceptors. The rod photoceptors are needed for night vision and peripheral vision. So if you don't have the rods, you have a tunnel vision and you're unable to see at night or under low light conditions. So the RPE65 associated problems come from the rod photoceptors. So essentially, this is disease of the rod photoceptors. So you understand, it does not affect immediately the visual acuity. It starts very early on with night blindness, 
and with a lack, the loss of peripheral vision. The retinal structure, because you, you, you may know that the photoceptors, they don't regenerate. <coughs> so once you've got a dystrophy, a degeneration of the retina, it, it's gone. <coughs> so in this specific mutation, the retinal structure, and this is different than from other types of disease, of these diseases, it's preserved <coughs> over a long time. And you have got two distinct processes. One is the biochemical blockade, meaning the malfunctioning enzyme does not work and it is needed for the road photoceptor, the rod photoceptors. And you've got a degenerative process. We don't yet understand how, how this works. There are some theories that the some proteins, mutant proteins, that are being produced by the uh, defective gene, that they continue to cause degeneration. But we, do, we don't know, basically. We just observe what is happening with, the, with these patients. Steve mentioned, has had a citation about the impacts on patients and families. What is important to understand with this disease is that the vision degenerates. So it's not a stable state. It's not a person who doesn't have any vision at, at birth or loses vision to, due to an accident or something like that. It's you see in children that they are, have difficulties to, to function. They don't see properly. They are unable participate in sports, things like that. And then you get the diagnosis and it says your child is going to be blind when in young adulthood most probably. So the child, he cannot adapt to the vision. He's always adapting to a degrading vision that degrades over, over time. So this is different as an impact, first of all, it's in children and adolescents who make choices about the future, who want to go to school, who can't function properly, make choices for, for, for training. So any impact, any treatment that can simply stop the deterioration is being judged very important by these families. Um, and every number of years that you can postpone the deterioration in vision, it is also very important for these families because they may be complete education, maybe get some training, enter, enter, enter the workforce. So the main handicap is the inability to navigate independently in dimly lit settings. And this can show, for example, you're unable to go to a restaurant because there's not enough light. They may be unable to <coughs> navigate a dark corridor in school, there's not enough light. So this is the main impact for, 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 for these for the persons. Um, Blindness has important, is an important socioeconomic disadvantage in, in education and employment. So only 15% of individuals with a visual disability earn a bachelor degrees. 28% find full-time employment. And about 30% of blind Americans live beyond the poverty line. This is the treatment for retogene Nepavovec. This is the a way you call gene therapies in, 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 in words. So it's the first gene therapy that enters the market in the, market in the US that targets a disease with a specific mutation. And it's a virus, an adeno-associated virus, type 2, that targets the retina. And it transfects the cells with a functioning copy of RPE65. So it doesn't replace the gene, it adds a normal copy of the gene into the cell, and probably this normal copy is working in parallel to the mutated gene. In order to deliver the, the vector, the gene, with the genetic information, you must get it very close to the target cells. So the target cells are in the retinal epithelium, uh, Epithelium, sorry. And so how do you get it there? First of all, you must make a vitrectomy, 
vitrectomy, you take out the gel-like substance in the tear of the eye. This is a standard procedure, Dr. K and others, they do to do, do it routinely. What is a bit, what happens more rarely is you have to inject the liquid with the virus under the retina, between the retina and the, and the RPE. This is a, a bilateral treatment with the second eye being treated at least six days after the first eye, so you wait for complications. At the same time, you don't wait, want to wait for too long because you want to avoid immune reactions. It's a very important point for all genetic therapies. Its administration will take place in a very limited number of centers with prior intensive hands-on training of, of eye surgeons. There have been other gene therapies that targeted the same gene. They are not the same. It's very important to understand this. There are very many differences in the, in the vector itself, in the way that the gene is delivered. So we do have some experience with other gene therapies in trials, none is on the market, but this is not the same product. So what do we know about the effectiveness of this treatment? <coughs> so we do have 41 patients in either phase one, one A, one B, and, and three trials for 81 eyes because one eye couldn't be treated because of glaucoma. What is interesting, you've got 34 different mutations in this gene in the 41 patients, which really shows the greater variability. So the phase one trial was 31 patients. It was a randomized, controlled, but open label trial. So there was no, no sham surgery or, 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 or something like that. The average age, was 15.1 year, with the ages ranging from 4 to 44 years. And currently, we have an up, uh, up, follow up available for up to three years. Patients have been treated five years ago, seven years ago, and patients are saying, I had the treatment five years ago, I'm still, it's still working. Uh, doctors say, I treated the first patient seven years ago and it's still working, but the data being available either as publications or presentations are limited to three years. So this is a major point for the, the effectiveness and the durability of the, the effect we're going to talk about. A few words on outcome measures. When you go have your eyes examined, I think everybody has their eyes examined at one point. So the first thing is the visual acuity. 2020 vision, that's a Snellen chart. The other thing you, you, you may have is a visual field test. But this is sort of the basic exams that you're getting for, for, you, for your, 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 your eye. So 2020 vision, at, when you're at 2200, this means that you have to be 20 feet in front of a chart, which a normal person with good vision would be 200 feet away. So this is the US definition of legal blindness. You can express this in other ways because what is happening for this population, the level, the average, the mean level of visual acuity is around legal blindness, which is very important to understand. Some of these patients have quite a good vision Good vision, others are below the level of legal blindness. But the mean is around this, this level. And the treatment is not going to change it. So this is very important to, to, to understand. With very low vision, at one point, you cannot long and longer take the, the Snellen chart with the, with the figures. So you're limited to uh, finger counting or you're limited to hand motion at differences, at different uh, distances. So the best way, and that's what we're going to use in the modeling to express visual acuity is as a log mar or as a decimal scale. Perfect vision, 2020, log mar zero, 2200, log mar one, and, and so on. So as the log mar goes up, the vision, vision decreases. So this, this is the visual acuity which uh, was a, a secondary endpoint in this trial. You 
visual field tests, an exploratory endpoint. I'm not going to describe this. It's going to, it's, it's available. We can discuss this with the experts if you want to go and how this was, was being measured. And something which most people who go to uh, ophthalmologist don't experience is the light sensitivity threshold testing, which measure, measures the threshold for perceiving a light. So this is very important for these patients because they are affected on the rod function, on the night vision. But this is also only a secondary endpoint in this, in, 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 in this trial. The company working, and at the request of the FDA, working with the FDA, they developed a new outcome tool that integrates the sensitivity threshold testing, the visual acuity, and the visual field, because all these different functions determine how you are able to, to function with your vision under, uh, in an environment. So what they developed as a primary endpoint of this trial is what is called a multi-luminance mobility test, MLMT, and the outcome was at one year after for, for bilateral vision. So what does this, this test look like? It's, it's a maze uh, where people have to navigate through and directly afterwards you'll be seeing a video on actually a patient before and after the treatment navigating that, that maze. So you have uh, different obstacles, different, and the, the, the patients have to navigate this, this maze under different light conditions. So on the, the, the left hand, you have got different lux levels. Lux is the measure for the, the light intensity. So a lux level of one is a moonless summer night of indoor night light. Normally, people with normal vision 100% can navigate this maze at this light level. Other people may need more lux levels, an office setting, or sort of the outdoor parking, and, 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 and all these levels. And so this is the, the way how people are assessed on their ability to function and uh, uh, in an environment with, with obstacles. It is important also to understand that this maze has been laid out for people with the level of legal blindness, which shows that actually this is the, the level, average level of the patients who, who, are, who are navigating that. Um, and it's being assessed by, it's videotaped, and it's being assessed on, 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 the, on the outcome and scores are given, given to that. So uh, we're going to show you a, a video of an example of a patient going through this, 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 this maze. Start. Okay, so you have got, um, as you can see in the video, the subject is navigating the course with her feet due to impaired vision and hitting many of the obstacles. And it took the subject just over 3.5 minutes to complete the course. The cutoff point is usually three minutes and they're allowed up to four errors.
So if the patient started at one lux, is in this video is because she failed all the other light levels. So she had a, uh, sorry, no, she, go, she goes up to the other light levels. So you, you, you they start at low light level, if you fail, you go to the next light level. That's how it's, how it's, how it's being assessed. next one will be quicker, so this is 3.5 minutes. You'll see on the next one after the treatment will be much more easier for her to navigate the, the maze. Three point five minutes is long. <laughs> You're watching a video. So this is one year Start. after the treatment at the same intensity of light. So the subject is, is the person is able to navigate the course much more quickly, under 20 seconds, and many obstacles were avoided while before she had to use her feet. So there's an improvement, and this is a one level improvement which is judged to be significant uh, by the company. So this is the outcome for the randomized open label controlled trial. So what you have, does it work? Okay. You've got the time. It's day 30, day 90, day 100, one year. And this is the lux levels. So the impact is while the average was around 50 lux being able to navigate, with the intervention, they were within less than 30 days, or maybe 30 days, they were able to function under four lux levels. And the effect with the other eye being treated uh, about a week afterwards. So what you see is that the effect stayed one year, two years, and we got data from presentation on three years. So currently, this effect is being stable up to three years. The control population actually went down and went a tiny bit up. Maybe there's a learning effect involved. And they got the intervention, both eyes being treated with the same protocol. So they also went up, and actually they went higher than the other ones. We don't have any explanations for that. And this effect is also being being sustained. So this is the improvement and being statistically significant. What are the other outcome measures? I mentioned the other possible outcomes and measures. So the full field light sensitivity improved and was stable also up to three years. And there was a strong correlation with the MLMT test we just saw. Because this test was being developed for the, the trial, but it's not something as far as we know, that's been going to use into clinical practice. So you must use a test in clinical practice that is already available, and this is probably going to be the, the full field light sensitivity. The visual acuity was not statistically significant different when averaged over both eyes, but visual acuity of the better seeing eye did show some improvement. There were improvements in the visual field. However, there were slight declines after three years, but we got this information only through a poster. There were no specific details available for that. Um, a word on harms, and I would like to take a step backward because before talking about the harms that were being observed in the 41 patients, we're talking about gene therapy. You've got a new way of treating. What are the dangers associated with gene therapy? If you do a Google search and look gene therapy and death, 
you will find a, a, a information of somebody who's called Jesse, Jesse Gelsinger, who died in 1999 from a gene therapy. He had a metabolic disease which was stable, controlled with diet, and he died. What happened was a very strong immune response, an immune storm. So since this death, all gene therapy trials try to avoid immune uh, system reactions at all costs. This immune type of immune reaction does not apply and is very highly unlikely for a therapy like Retogene. First of all, you have got the retinal blood barrier in, in, in the eye. You have got the administration protocol, a one-time administration with the second eye being treated closely afterwards. And you have got oral prednisone that all patients have to take. So it's highly unlikely this kind of thing could happen with, with this therapy. The other deaths that were associated with overall gene therapy was uh, in a severe combined immunodeficiency where, where patients were being improved, but they developed later leukemia. How did this happen? Through a process that caused insertion mutagenesis. The gene was inserted into the genome and it activated a, 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 a gene causing, a cancer causing gene. So can this happen in this therapy? Again, the answer is no, because the gene in this, in this therapy is not being inserted in the genome and the cells don't divide. So both of these effects that have been prescribed present in other gene therapies cannot occur in, 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 with, with the retro gene. So what are the risks that have been observed with the gene therapy? They're essentially related to the surgical aspects of the procedure. We know about vitrectomy, it causes cataracts. You may have infections, you have good retinal tears, and the transenient elevated intraocular pressure. There were two patients who sustained permanent vision loss, I think it's a phase one trial, uh, through infection, and the other one was foveal thinning. Uh, but there was no harm associated with the product itself and there was no immune response, any significant immune response that was being, being, being observed. Um, so what do we know, what we don't know? So first of all, it's important to, to understand the variability in the therapeutic effect. So some of the, the the patients, as you saw, they're different clinical presentations. Some of the patients, they have quite good vision, close to normal, other are below legal blindness. Visual fields are different in different patients. And this is an, a new endpoint that has been developed for the trial. It has not been validated as to real world impact on the quality of life. So you saw the maze, yes, there is a, is a difference, but what does this mean? for daily quality of life. You've got, got patient testimonies on that, that, that describe how important this is, but there is no measurement as of this on, on, on the quality of life. And this is also important, um, if you, how you measure the impact, because the company proposed a rebate scheme we are going to, to, to discuss later on. So what is the measurement for a failure? If you take the LMNT test for the 20 patients, for we have the results, it's 5% failure rate. If you take the uh, FST, the light sensitivity, and you use a, a difference that's being judged significant, it's 30% failure. So there's some uncertainties on what can be considered as success or, or, or not. And we have no published data, as I said, beyond three years, and there are some uncertainties on the long-term effects. Does the degeneration go on? With other gene therapies, the effect wore off after two or three years, but this was not the same thing, but it seems clear that the degeneration part is, is another, is, may not be affected by the therapy. But we, we don't know the durabilities. You have got three years. And long-term safety data, it's a new treatment, if, even if the severe complications observed at the gene trials have not been observed, we don't know what may happen because it's a new way of treating new treatment paradigm. So there is a high certainty overall of at least a small to substantial improvement over standard care in a population perspective, meaning that individual patients may benefit greatly 
but overall, <laughs> it's only a small to substantial improvement over the standard of care, which is no, 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 no therapy, just adapting to the, to the loss. So we consider the evidence uh, to be incremental or better, B plus, in the ratings of, uh, of ISA. And some of the benefits for patients and families are not captures in the effectiveness study. And it's also difficult to capture this in, in, in the quality you're going to hear about now. Thanks. Well, I think we'll take some questions from the panel. If we have questions regarding the evidence, um, if anybody would like to kick us off with a, a great question, uh, I appreciate that very much. Thanks, Edward. I think I know the answer to the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It really has to do with uh, tre treatment later in life. Um, I, I think I understand that there's a degenerative component that isn't impacted by the treatment. Would we ever foresee retreating patients in the future beyond the, the 20 years impact that we expect? Or is this a once in a lifetime treatment? This question was asked at the FDA hearing. And the answer Spark provided was no, we don't envision to treat patients after a second time. First of all, you need to know also that's about one-fifth of the surface of the retina that's been tried treated. It's not the complete retina, it's one-fifth. And the answer is no to avoid, as far as I understand, any immune effects. So as I said, people are very much afraid that there may be some immune effects even with all the precautions. But maybe Dr. K, do you have any, any other insight into the retreatment? I, I think it's just important to point out that yes, that question was asked at the FDA hearing. And, and the company, you know, Spark, responded that that question has not been answered. Is it safe to treat 20 years later? But it, it and they certainly, this is, uh, this is, a, the company is, is looking at this as a one-time treatment without any future retreatment. Of course, the bilateral treatment within one week. It is sort of interesting to look at, if you look at the phase one follow-on data, some of those patients were treated one year later. So it certainly theoretically can be safely done one year later, and you could expect that if you were to be looking for immune responses, um, you know, one year later might be a good test of that, because certainly that would allow for an immune response. And so patients, absolutely human patients, have been retreated one year later in the other eye. Um, it has not been done yet, as far as I'm aware, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone in the room, that the same eye has been retreated in a human patient. Um, so that, I mean, that's the data that we have. I think that, you know, today we're just, you know, focusing on the data that we have and, you know, what we're, this is a, a one-time treatment, bilateral, within one week, and would not be expecting to be retreating those, those patients in the future. A question about the uh, MLMT score. I think that because so much of the data is going to rely on that endpoint and the results we see there, um, it seems to me that there's a big difference between using a pass-fail scale and more granularly the video which showed someone getting through that uh, the maze in very quick time. So I'm wondering, uh, it's my understanding that the score of passing includes making less than four errors and getting through it in up to three minutes. So someone doing it in 259 and someone doing it in 30 seconds, they would appear with the same endpoint result. Is that, is that correct? Yes, but then they go to the next level. So Even if, if they reach if, if, one? If, if they pass it, let's say if they pass it 50 lux, then they go to 10 lux, and probably at the 10 lux level, the difference will be evident. So you think it could manifest that way? I think it's a good way to measure it. I don't know. I think it's, an, it's, it's a good test to integrate the different visual functions. And, and can you elaborate on um, any thinking or real world proxies that were kind of aligned with the up to four mistakes in three minutes? Why, do you know why those targets were picked and what they're meant to proxy in real life circumstances? I, I don't have any information. Maybe at the questions with the, uh, with the manufacturer, we can, we can answer those questions. However, there have been, as part of the trial, there have been home visits, there have been observations uh, uh, at home. What does differences mean? 
but there have been no publications or presentations on the subject, so we do, cannot translate the improvement into real-world settings. Thank you. So I just wanted to also make an announcement that uh, we have uh, Steve Russell, uh, one of our clinical experts, uh, joining us by phone, so welcome, Steve. We may uh, feel free to, to let us know that you want to weigh in on any of these comments or, or questions. Uh, we may direct one to you in, in just a minute. I think the last question would have been very interesting for Dr. Russell because Dr. Russell is the principal author for the phase three trial. So Dr. Russell, did you hear the question on why the, and how the scores would yes. be adjusted? If you can answer to that, maybe. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the data uh, was presented at the FDA advisory meeting and it's going to be presented at a, a upcoming meeting in, I believe, in uh, July at the ASRS meeting. The, um, the average improvement in terms of uh, completion rate at, at, uh, at level, at the passing level, whatever that passing level was after intervention, so, uh, the, the initial passing time was about a a minute 80 average, and the passing time after that was around 30 to 40 seconds. So that gives you some idea that there was actually an improvement not only in level, but there's also an improvement in completion time. But the questioner was correct in that it was counted as a pass if it was two minutes and 59 uh, seconds. However, there were time penalties for every error that was made. So there was a, a at least a, I think it was a 10 second penalty for each, each uh, uh, stepping off the course or touching an obstacle. That's great, thank you very much. Brian, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. This may be for Dr. Russell and Dr. K, but it's my understanding the protein that is misfolded and obviously it's still being made, you're putting in a gene to make some normal protein, but the misfolded protein builds up in the cells and leads to cell death. Um, so that's an ongoing process. Do, I was unclear as to how severe or rapid that process of cell death is with the toxic protein. Uh, I can start on that one, but I, Dr. Russell can chime in as well. So I've looked into this a lot and you know, the, the, Classically, when you think of autosomal recessive disease, we think of that as um, a loss of function. So it's the gain of function, the, the toxic effect we think of an autosomal dominant disease. Um, that is where we classically think of, you know, so rhodopsin-associated dominant retinitis pigmentosa is a classic disease where we think of rhodopsin as being misfolded and causing toxic death to those cells over time. And there have been all kinds of studies, even some funded by FFB, looking at valproic acid and neurotrophic drugs to try to neurotrophic um, dr decrease the risk of cytotoxicity over time. So that's dominant disease. We're talking about a recessive disease. Um, really, if you, you, if you look at the, the phenotypes and the genotype, there was no, gen from my understanding, there, there was no phenotype-genotype correlation in this study of effect. But my understanding is that you know, most of the RP65 recessive mutations are null. So these are loss of function. So I don't know if it's true, and I would love to have a basic scientist, Houseworth, or somebody who does, you know, does this uh, from a basic science standpoint, you know, look at this. But that would have been done in, you know, th that would be in mice and mice mo mouse models, which are quite different. But in the human, it is very possible that there aren't a lot of misfolded proteins floating around causing damage. Um, the papers that have looked at, you know, the question of, of neurodegeneration and continued photoreceptor gener generation over time, some of them out of the Jacobson lab and some of them out of the Bainbridge Ali lab, um, those papers don't specifically talk about the hypothesis of the misfolded protein. So I don't really know where that idea, I was looking at that in executive summer and I actually had a question on, you know, where that came from, the idea of these misfolded proteins uh, in this particular disease causing damage. Um, because we don't really have good data that recessive RP65 is going to do anything other than be a null mutation that causes loss of function without uh, abnormal misfolded proteins. It, it's absolutely true that 
probably only 20 to 30 percent of the retina is treated, so there's a decent portion of retina that is not treated that will continue to have its natural history progression. So yes, some peripheral retina will continue to degenerate, but I don't know about the misfolded protein um, within the same cell argument. I, I don't know if I buy that, but Dr. Russell, you can certainly chime in. Well, that, that was well put, and I agree with everything you said. We don't really have great data specifically looking at uh, generation in the region in which the, the uh, cells have been transfected. Um, and there's controversy about how long of an effect there will be, uh, as, you, as you know. Uh, the best data I guess I could point to would be uh, the Briar dog model that uh, uh, where uh, juvenile dogs were treated under one year uh, retain central visual function lifelong. Uh, at death of 10 years, they still retained the, ability, the abilities that they had regained at the time of intervention. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the mechanistically, I think the genes are being, these uh, trans genes are being overdriven by the promoter, if there is uh, some sort of uh, negative feedback regulation in the nascent promoter, my guess is that uh, whatever nascent uh, null mutations are being produced are probably suppressed. And uh, one, back that canine paper, um, I think it's very interesting part of that canine paper looks at dogs that were treated at a later age and talks about that, yes, there was some photoreceptor generation at a later age. But I think it's very important, and those are the older dogs, the, the, the flip side was true in that paper, that right. the younger dogs prior to retinal degeneration <laughs> onset, once they had the gene therapy, they had halt, they halted their photoreceptor generation and halted the natural history in those dogs if the treatment was done prior to photoreceptor generation. Um, the second point that I, Correct. the last point is, there is an RP65 dominant mutation that exists. There's a paper on it. I have the reference if anyone wants it. Um, it's, it causes, I think it's ASP477 uh, GLY is the amino acid. It's a dominant. He's in an airport. It's an overhead announcement. What is that? Oh. He has an overhead announcement where. Okay. So there's a dominant RP65 uh, mutation that exists in humans and um, it causes an extremely different phenotype. So these patients have a much different disease. This is a dominant form of RP65 disease that exists in humans and they have extensive choroidal atrophy. It looks totally different. So their photoreceptor generation is, is much more aggressive and different. And so those are the patients where there's the, probably the misfolding and that argument going on. And that is not the disease that we're talking about today. We'll take like one or two more comments from the, from the group and then we want to move on. Reem, do you have a, a brief one? I actually have a quick question about the slide we have in front of us, which are the results. And um, you mentioned this very briefly, but it looks like the control group had a learning effect and they even done better if they, um, you know, when they were uh, treated a year later compared to the group that received the treatment in the beginning. And um, any thoughts about that, you know, trying to learn about individuals with um, visual impairment, there's clearly a huge ability for adaptation and, and learning. Um, so how does that potentially affect the results? I know we have the three years, and, but could, is it plausible to say that the learning effect could have been achieved over the years? Uh, Jerry, correct me if I'm, I'm mistaken, but as far as, I mean, the, th the three-year timeline is only the presentation, so we don't have the individual details and as much details as we do have for, the, for these outcomes you're, you're shown. Uh, the difference still is 1.6, so they went up 0.2. The initial difference is 1.8, so after that it's, it would be 1.6, which is still higher than what is considered as a significant impact, which is, which, is, which is one. We don't have any explanation, not only Dr. Russell have, but we don't, we don't know where this comes from. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Reem. Uh, Caitlin, I wanted to come go to you if you have any comments on, uh, you know, obviously there's a, the outcome measures in this particular case are, are very important and uh, people are making a lot of judgments about the durability of, of this and, and the benefit of it based on kind of a newly constructed outcome measure. Um, from your perspective and you know, representing other patients, like what do you think of the 
the MLMT um, as a as a method. Is it, what does what are the benefits and weaknesses from your perspective? If you don't mind sharing, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, you know, it, it is something that you have to get used to. It's not a normal test. But I do want to comment on the previous question about the three mistakes and um, the arbitrary value that what, what makes a person, after you make four mistakes, fail. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm sure Spark has the information that there was previous testing between visually impaired that weren't just RP65 and those who are sighted. So they did um, the MLT to compare the two to see if it was a good measure. And therefore, if a person like yourselves walked through the maze, it's a possibility that you might knock into a few things yourself. So by giving a person three mistakes to still allow you to pass, I mean, it's, it's a small chart. I can hardly fit my two feet in a square. Right. <laughs> and I'm an adult compared to the kids that go through it. So there's always a chance for errors. Anyone who sees can trip. So definitely, I can understand having a few errors um, along the way. But I do feel as though, even as a patient, you know, the first year, I was a control subject. And I did have that continuous measure to be able to see the lack of improvement. I mean, yes, I'm getting a little bit used to, OK, here's the maze again. But it, it is completely noticeable to me that I was, once I had the treatment, that there was improvement. That when they started at the lowest light level that I could actually navigate when before I'm going off the path, I'm having to be redirected and someone put me back on the path. Um, and so it definitely, it does have real world um, applications. Walking through even this room before I had straighted would have been almost impossible at this time because of the lack of sunlight, the, the dimly lit, these would be dim to me. So. To be able to navigate, to find a seat, to know where exits are would have been almost impossible until after the treatment. So to have a person walk through a maze like a room with a bunch of chairs is, I think, definitely applicable, especially in school life. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your comments. We'll go to Rob, and then we'll wrap it up and move into our next section. So given what we saw in the two tests with the MLMT, could you describe what that change, which was fairly dramatic, what kind of impact on uh, quality of life would, would that then imply to see the, the ability to navigate a, a space like that? Caitlin or Janet, yeah. I mean, Janet, you please feel free to, to chime sure. in. It may be a good question for you. Yeah, I'm happy to contribute my thoughts uh, to that uh, in that uh, individuals who oftentimes are, are experiencing vision loss, regardless of what the condition is, obviously quality of life has a significant impact uh, depending on, on a number of factors. The primary factor uh, for individuals and, and the impact on quality of life of when you're losing your vision is do you have the compensatory skills you know that are in place to help you navigate your way through this process it's not a consistent process and when individuals lose their vision obviously the exacerbation of that loss of vision occurs over a period of time like an rpe 65 um, so the quality of life, first of all, is immediately impacted. Uh, individuals' lives are often uh, come to a, a complete halt. Uh, as a former vocational rehabilitation counselor for over 20 years, we often see individuals who will not go out into the into their communities. They will not socialize. They they uh, significantly. Uh, limit, you know, the type of contact that they may have, as, as was previously mentioned with regard to going into restaurants. Um, the educational process is significantly impacted by individuals who experience these types of conditions uh, because they are consistently thinking about things like, well, I have to get home before uh, 4 p.m. I also have retinitis pigmentosa and can remember distinctly 
being very cognizant about time because you feel as though you're living under this umbrella, you know, that you have to get in before dark. It, I, we used to call it the vampire effect, you know, that <laughs> vampires have to be in by dark. And it, you kind of felt like that because you, you know that you're constantly thinking about uh, your limitations that are going to be significantly impacted after um, you go through this particular, particular time phase, you know, during the day. So, and also thinking about employment uh, thinking about the role reversals that often happen as a result of the vision loss in the family. Individuals will oftentimes change roles. Uh, the presence of depression and demotivation also plays a significant role for these individuals. So the quality of life is really a broad span, and, and depending on the level of intervention, <coughs> the timing of that intervention, and the timing of additional support services that are critical, uh, in, in these types of situations are, are really going to determine uh, the extent of the quality of life or the loss of quality of life. Thank you for uh, those very descriptive and uh, very descriptive comments. And, and it's actually a wonderful and kind of beautiful transition to our next section of, uh, of, the, uh, of the presentation of data today. So we're going to kind of move into the next group, which is um, looking at cost effectiveness. And in that discussion, um, There'll be a, sort of a quantification, so to speak, or an effort to quantify quality of life. Okay. I'm Marita Zimmerman. I'm from the University of Washington, and I'm going to go over the economic analysis part of our report. And we have no disclosures to report. The primary aim of this analysis was to estimate the cost effectiveness of veredigine for vision loss associated with bilelic RPE65 mediated inherited retinal disease compared to the standard of care over a lifetime horizon. I'm going to first go through an overview of our methods. We used a two-state Markov model for this analysis, and that essentially just means that we tracked patients who are alive with RPE65 mediated retinal disease and death. And then within that alive state, we tracked several health, health outcome measures, including age, best eye visual acuity, visual field, levels of visual impairment and blindness and quality of life. Ideally here, we would also be tracking full field light sensitivity and MLMT results. We're limited in our model to not only what was measured in the clinical trial, but also what we can link from the literature to either quality of life or cost. And because the MLMT is a new outcome measure, that literature just doesn't exist yet, so we weren't able to link it in this model. The target population was individuals in the United States with bilelic RPE65 mediated inherited retinal disease. We started by modeling a population who received veredigine treatment at a mean age of 15. That's representative of the trial population. It's also representative of the population who will be receiving this treatment when it's rolled out. And this uh, population has a mean baseline best eye visual acuity of 0.096 decimals and visual field of 363 degrees. Uh, I just want to try to briefly preempt some confusion about visual acuity scales. Reiner mentioned this a little, a little bit, but visual acuity is measured by several different scales. The one we're probably all most familiar with is the Snellen scale. That's the letter chart and translates to you know 20, 20, 20 over 40. Um, once you get to a really low level of visual acuity, you have to switch to using different scales because you can't use that letter chart anymore. But it's a continuous, you know, visual acuity is a continuous scale. So two of the scales that are used for that are decimals and logmar. And th they're related to each other exponentially. Um, so in our report, and most of what you'll see here is in a decimal scale, <coughs> and uh, that's increasing decimals is better vision. So perfect seeing is one. Um, 0.1 is legal blindness. So this population, 0.096, that's right around the level of legal blindness. Um, and I'll, when we talk, you'll see Logmar a couple times, but I'll talk about it then. Uh, we also modeled a younger population, and the goal for this was there's some hope that over time we'll be able to diagnose this sooner before patients have had as much progression of visual disability. Um, and in that case, they'd have a higher baseline visual ability. So you can see there, 
baseline, best eye visual acuity, and visual field are higher. So really, we're just using age as a proxy for baseline visual ability. Um, I will also mention that all these values are mean values. We wouldn't expect everyone in this population to have this value. There'll be a range around it, but these are the means. All right, we started by using a US healthcare system perspective for this model. That includes direct medical costs, so that's physician visit costs and medical treatment costs. In this model, we also included direct medical costs for ophthalmic related depression and trauma. So those are all in the US healthcare system perspective. We did a second analysis from a modified societal perspective, and those included expanded costs for direct non medical costs and indirect costs. So the direct non-medical costs that we included were caregiver costs, and that's for both formal and informal caregivers, transportation costs, and nursing home care. And then we included indirect costs for education, which is additional costs due to uh, visual impairment above normal education costs and productivity loss. A few key model assumptions. We assumed that biallelic RPE65 mediated inherited retinal disease and varetagine treatment do not affect mortality. We assumed that the treatment effect is maintained for 10 years, followed by a 10 year waning of effect, after which the rate of decline in vision is the same as with standard of care. We made this assumption, um, as Reiner mentioned, we have three years of data. We have up to seven years of anecdotal reports saying we think this treatment effect is maintained. So we a little optimistically assumed that that would be up to 10 years and that it wouldn't just suddenly, the rate wouldn't suddenly drop at the end of the 10 years. So we, it slowly declines over the next 10 years. And then finally, we assume that impacted individuals are considered visually impaired when visual acuity is less than 0.63 decimals or visual field under 1200 degrees and considered blind when visual acuity is under 0.015 decimals or visual field under 48 degrees. Now, we don't have a lot of data on natural history because this is such a small population. So the natural history that uh, data that we use is shown here. So this is from a poster presented at the Association for Research and Vision in Ophthalmology in 2017. In the top panel, we see visual acuity, and this is one of those times that this is measured in log mar. So this is a reverse exponential relationship from what we see in decimals. So higher log mar is worse vision, and you see that exponential form. And for relation uh, on the y-axis here, zero is perfect vision, that's 2020, and one log mar is equivalent to 20 over 200. So that's the level of legal blindness. So that's right about where these patients are starting. And then on the bottom panel, we see visual field, which is a linear decrease in visual field over time with age. In order to model the improvement with veretagene, uh, we used a change in best eye visual acuity of minus 0.05 logmar. Again, decreasing logmar, better vision. Uh, we used best eye here, even though average of both eyes was the main visual acuity result presented in the, in the trial manuscript, because we got some feedback that part of the reason that that difference in visual acuity was not statistically significant is because the best eye is more clinically significant. Um, that's, your vision is more driven by the best eye than the average of both eyes. So um, there was more of a difference when we looked into the individual patient data for best side than for average of both eyes. We also use a change in visual field of increase of 282 degrees, and as I mentioned, that treatment effect was maintained for 10 years, followed by a 10-year waning period. All right, in order to model quality of life, we have to connect some of these visual outcome measures with utility values. And that's limited in the literature. We don't have that connection for this specific patient population. So we used a uh, data from another retinal population. And one thing to keep in mind as we talk about this is that other retinal disease populations are different. And in this case, particularly, they're usually older. And age does have an impact on quality of life. So that's a limitation just to keep in mind that uh, could influence our results. 
So we used a source that linked visual acuity, uh, that's the graph on the left, the blue line, visual acuity with utility and created a linear function for utility. Uh, the light gray is where patients would be considered visually impaired and that dark gray bar on the left is uh, blind. And from this source, we actually don't have any data in that blind category. So we're limited to assuming the function continues linearly. We then uh, mapped to visual field categories from visual acuity by saying, you know, what would the visual, what's the visual acuity at the level of legal blindness? What would the vi visual field be? And uh, connected the points that way and created an equivalent visual field function. <coughs> and then tracked both of those utility functions over time through the model. And whichever one gave a lower utility at each time, that's the one that we used. We included three adverse events, eye irritation, eye puritis, and macular hole. These rates are from the clinical trial. They each had a cost associated with them, and macular hole had a small disutility, 0.0533 for six months. Finally, our economic inputs. So ideally, we would have costs for each person by both severity of visual ability and by age. We know both of those factors are, should influence costs. We don't have that, so we use two different sources for cost data uh, and whichever, for each cost category, use whichever one would be more of a driver for that type of cost. So the ones you see in the red box are the direct medical costs. Those are included in the healthcare system, U.S. healthcare system perspective, and these are stratified by visual acuity. The highest visual acuity above 0.08, there's zero costs, and then the lowest visual acuity is the blue bar on the left. When we look at caregiver and transportation costs, you can see more clearly that decrease as visual ability increases, costs decrease for those costs. Oh, and uh, additional uh, direct medical costs, the cost of veritagene is $850,000 and just under $5,000 for the surgery. And then we have uh, a few more of the costs for the modified societal perspective that are stratified by age. So on the left, we have productivity loss for patients who are visually impaired, and then for blindness, productivity loss is highest for the age group of age 40 to 64. And then we have for patients under age 18, costs for education, and then finally for nursing home care for visually impaired and for blind for people over age 65. All right, our results. So. The first part of the model is visual acuity and visual field over time. The top panel is the older population, age 15, with, uh, and the bottom panel is the younger population, age three. So the blue lines are standard of care and the green lines are veritagene. In both the visual acuity and visual field, you see that 10-year duration of treatment effect. This is flat for 10 years, and then we see a slow decline for the next 10 years until we get back to the same rate as standard of care. Uh, to orient you on the y-axis here, we're looking at decimals again. So perfect, perfect vision in decimals would be one. The top of our scale here is 0.4, that's equivalent to 20 over 50. And then down here, 0.1 is 20 over 200, that's legal blindness. <clears throat> one other thing that I wanna point out here is that you do see a difference between these two panels. And part of that is an artifact of that translation from logmar to decimals. Because it's an exponential conversion, that means that the starting point, the baseline, matters. So because the younger patients are starting at a higher visual acu baseline visual acuity, we see that manifests as a bigger jump here between standard of care and veritagene. It also means that because this bl solid blue line is an exponential curve, when the, the bottom panel is starting at a higher point, you're at a steeper point in that curve. So standard of care visual acuity is decreasing more quickly over those first few years of treatment while veritagene is held constant over those 10 years. And that creates a bigger gap, a bigger improvement over these first few years in visual acuity. So you see that bigger uh, 
jump over time for the younger population. Again, that's because we're using age as a proxy for baseline visual ab ability. When we apply our utility functions to this, we see a similar shape. You see that flat line for the first 10 years for veretigine treated people. And then we again see that little bit bigger gap due to the visual ability in the patients who started with a higher baseline visual ability. When we look at our costs as well, we see just over $850,000 for veretigine costs, direct medical costs. And then uh, when we're looking at the, this group is what's included in the US healthcare system perspective. When we look at the modified societal perspective, we see some more significant cost offsets, particularly caregiver costs and productivity costs. You see that those are lower for veretigine patients compared to standard of care. When we look at the graph on the right, we see an increase in quality adjusted life years. It's 1.3 additional qualities gained over remaining lifetime for people who receive veretigine. And when we combine those, we get an ICER of $644,000 per quality from the US healthcare system perspective and 480,000 per quality from the modified societal perspective. When we look at the younger population with better baseline visual ability, we see more exaggerated cost offsets. So we see cost offsets here for direct medical costs and more exaggerated for some of these other costs, caregiver costs, productivity, transportation costs. We also see a bigger jump in quality adjusted life years of over two qualities. <clears throat> and when we combine those, we get an ICER of $288,000 per quality from the US healthcare system perspective and 135,000 per quality from the modified societal perspective. We did a sen sensitivity analysis varying each model parameter to see what the drivers of this model were. This is for the older population. Top panel is US healthcare system perspective and the bottom panel is modified societal. Um, slightly different order, but in both cases, the drivers are the function for utilities, the baseline visual acuity, and the cost of veretigine. And results were similar when we did this for the younger population as well. <clears throat> we also did a uh, probabilistic sensitivity analysis where we varied all model parameters to look at what the probability is that veretigine would be cost effective compared to standard of care at various willingness to pay thresholds. And to point out, here's $150,000 per quality, which is a commonly used threshold. For orphan conditions, we might look at higher. Here's $250,000. Um, these are the young, these ones that in increase more quickly are the younger population, and these increasing more slowly are the older population. And then you also see that we sh the modified societal perspective shifts those probabilities to the left. We also did a scenario analysis where we looked at a lifetime duration of treatment effect, so no longer considering that 10-year effect if veretigine uh, stays constant over the remaining lifetime we see bigger cost offsets. So ver other costs uh, are lower for veretigine patients. We also see a bigger jump in quality adjusted life years. And that leads to an uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $385,000 per quality from the, modif from the US healthcare system perspective and $228,000 per quality from the modified societal perspective. If we do that same analysis on the younger population, we get down to an ICER of $161,000 per quality from the US healthcare system perspective and 16,000 from the modified societal perspective. I also wanted to highlight a few of the comments that we received throughout this process. We did make several changes to our methods as we were going along due to some of the feedback that we received. We got comments that the utility values and methods that we were using for our utility calculation were not appropriate for this population. We did change the source for utility values that we were using. We also performed a scenario analysis using a different source with nonlinear utility values, and we removed some underlying population utility values that we had in the uh, draft report uh, so as to avoid double counting of disutilities. We also got a comment that costs were not high or inclusive enough for this population. So we switched cost sources. We used additional cost sources that incorporated both severity and age. 
And then finally, we got a comment that the treatment effect duration was longer than what we modeled. We had originally talked about using five years after seeing that three-year data. So we expanded that to 10 years. We added a waning period, and we did the lifetime uh, scenario analysis. <clears throat> As with any model, we have limitations. The natural history of RPE65-mediated inherited retinal disease has not been thoroughly studied. We also have, are limited in measures of effectiveness for Vareta gene to those measures that were captured in the clinical trials as outcomes and what could be linked to quality of life, so visual acuity and visual field. Costs and quality of life measures have not, to our knowledge, been published for this specific patient population, so that's a limitation as well. In summary, we found that veretagine improves patient health outcomes compared to standard of care. However, the high cost makes this unlikely to be a cost-effective intervention in the types of patients studied at commonly used cost-effectiveness thresholds. If, in the future, it becomes possible to select patients earlier with preserved vision, similar to what we modeled in the younger population, and you use a societal perspective rather than the usual health care system perspective, in that case, veretagine may then be cost-effective at typical, typical cost-effectiveness thresholds. Thank you very much. We, we all appreciate it. Do we have any questions from the panel on clarification? And then we're going to hop right into the uh, manufacturer comments and discussion with, uh, with uh, Eric, Thomas Ciola. Yes. Just one Rob. question. So, uh, Rita, thank you. <laughs> so I'm still on myself. Could you just go back to slide 49 for a second and clarify, or at least Which discuss something? 49. Uh, two more back. There we go. Uh, no, the one with the, yeah, that. Okay. So if we look at the cost per quality um, at the different age groups, they're quite high, as you noted. But if you look at the cost per additional blindness, blindness free year from both perspectives, there, the numbers are actually quite a bit more favorable. Can you talk about how those we should interpret those differences? Because there's there's quite a bit to be said for those relatively low costs for mm -hmm. additional blindness-free years yeah. under some of these modeling scenarios. Yeah. Uh, I think it is important to look at other outcomes besides just quality-adjusted life years. We know that looking at only qualities is a limitation when you're looking at this, you know, very broad type of outcomes, uh, it's hard to put other measures into a specific context. One of the advantages of using qualies is we have this in the back of our head, what's, what's a reasonable ICER? We have this reference of 150,000 per quali. We've seen costs per quali in other disease areas. We don't have that kind of reference for what is it worth to avoid one blindness-free year. So uh, I think we, we, you can't directly compare those numbers to an ICER. You have to think about those separately and value them as a different outcome. Thank you. Uh, Harold, real fast. Uh, I, have a, I have a question uh, uh, for the yeah. uh, three uh, participants in the back. Uh, the role of uh, the improvements in vision for caregivers is an important part of this analysis. And, I, and when I think about a three-year-old, I have a pretty good sense of how improved vision would impact a caregiver, or at least I think I have a good sense of that. I'm probably biased. Uh, when we think about a 15-year-old or when we think about someone who's older, what are the impacts on other people in your lives when there's an improvement in vision? How should that? How should we be thinking about that as we think about weighing, uh, you know, in this component of the analysis? I wonder, Caitlin, maybe you could speak to that. Well, um, definitely, I, I can only speak to my own experience and the experience slightly of my parents and my relatives that have, you know, been caregivers for me. Um, it takes a lot of effort and time to you know, from a young age to get you through school. The amount of effort to get a person who's visually impaired, let alone losing their vision, educated, it takes a ton of effort and time that not everyone has, and they have to sacrifice a lot from time at work, from just anything that you'd have to put in extra. I mean, even additionally, right now, um, I've been 
in a transition. I've been moving and I can't drive, but I was still at a different employment location. So both my fiance and my dad are having to drive me back and forth because otherwise I'm taking an Uber and spending tons of extra money just to get to my job. Um, so it's definitely an effort that others have to put in to help you be independent. And that's interesting because you're saying you're independent, but you always need this, this help and support system. But it definitely had changed after I'd had the treatment. I was able to go through school, go and get my master's degree without the continuous help of, can you look over my paper? Are there a ton of misspellings that I'm not catching? Can you help me look at my notes because I can't actually now reread my own notes? But to now have this vision back, to be able to continue to be in an educational environment that I originally could function in, but I was at a point in my college when I was starting to lose that ability that I didn't need as much intervention from these individuals. So it, it's their time <laughs> that it costs, and my own time. So it definitely adds in. I'd like to just add to that as well, because I think that also um, what Caitlin pointed out regarding the stressors, you know, in, in the family situation also uh, are really critical because many individuals uh, who are impacted by vision loss, and particularly if they're uh, in a family situation where one parent is, is assuming the, the dominant role in terms of responsibility, it creates incredible stressors on the family. Uh, there are are uh, many, many uh, instances where families will break up, you know, in terms of the stress that's caused as a result of having to deal with all the normal roles that parents assume in, an, in a family, particularly when there are multiple children involved as well. So oftentimes there are uh, those values that we don't often think about, but also the perception both of the individual impacted as well as the family members uh, changes as well. When there are opportunities for uh, in increased vision or treatment or therapy of any type uh, for the family members, it really does instill a sense of hope and creates a different value that we don't often think about on a regular basis. You know, the individual impacted their self-perception, their self-esteem, their self-confidence, their ability to really think about themselves in a very different role and in a different way so that it does not only in increase their independence, but it does change the, the whole family perception uh, of the impact of a condition if there is a therapy or treatment process as well. And then when you think about the role of how we all think about going to work every day, you know, it starts in childhood. So you actually want to start when those kids are two and three years old as early as possible uh, because it does change their own perception. You don't see it on a daily basis, but in the family reaction and how they choose to raise that child, the, the, the words that they use, you know, the type of treatment that that child receives. Receives, um, the stigmas that may be associated, those all play an incredible compounding impact on how that individual will eventually, by the time they're 14, 15 years old, see themselves and how they're able to contribute, socialize, work, you know, be educated. And so anytime that there's this type of intervention or strategy that can be put in place, uh, an opportunity, it, it has a, a critical uh, impact on, on not only the current situation, but the future. Thank, and thank, one you, last, thank you, Janet. So oh, comment from a clinician. I see a lot of these patients. I'm, of course, not visually impaired myself, but I have thousands of patients who are. And, and to answer your question as far as what happens as you age, I think one just key point I would say is that um, having looked at some of this data, of course, this is inherently difficult. To, we're trying to quantify something that is, by definition, quality of life is qualitative, you know, difficult to quantify. But um, I think one important thing that you brought up that I think that we should revisit is this the linear drop between uh, the, the hand motion or, or uh, light perception to, to no light perception. I, as a clinician, I think there is a massive change, and I'd love to hear um, from, uh, from other visually impaired patients' perspective on their friends with that difference. I think there's a massive nonlinear change that happens when a patient loses all of their light perception. So that 15-year-old, you asked about the older patients. These families are usually together for a lifetime. So a visually impaired patient 
without treatment or intervention, they're usually going to be very much invested with their family, and the family, the caretakers, will have significant involvement with that family for life. Either they'll live at home, they'll live in an apartment near home, obviously driving the patient around, taking care of them. So there's definitely a constant intervention going on from the, from the families. But if that patient does lose all light perception, and there's no light perception, and I have patients who sadly get to that point in my clinic, um, there is a massive change there. And I really do think the nonlinear model there would be the most correct for these patients. Um, patients are extremely depressed. They come into me, they're, they're totally different people. When those patients, and I see them go through that progression, when they lose light perception to no light perception, the entire dynamic of their life drastically changes. I can't put a number on it. I don't know how those things are derived, but I would absolutely expect it to be a nonlinear function when you when you lose when you go to those low vision levels and then a huge increase in the burden to their families. Helping an individual get through a room when they can navigate and have some light and, and sort of see shapes or motions, that's much different than helping someone who's completely seeing blackness. And that's what no light perception is. So I think a drastic I think the nonlinear model there would be the correct one. Claudio, do you have any yeah, I wanted to just to, add on this to point. To bring us home. Uh, because, Harold, I, I think that this this index around caregiving is one of the more fascinating ones that probably, especially here, we need to dig deeper into because uh, uh, it seems like most of the data on a caregiver perspective is from the perspective of the individual uh, needing help and support from family caregivers. I wonder if there's not the whole other half of caregiving, and because it's such an intergenerational function that we all end up eventually becoming caregivers for others. And if there's a loss opportunity for the treated individual to uh, provide care to dependent children or older parents so that they may be able to avoid early institutionalization or help as they uh, become older. So uh, taking away the ability of someone, if they're not treated with this, to provide care to their loved ones, the other half of the caregiving, them as a caregiver, not relying on caregivers, I think may be underestimated in some of the context here. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, of course, we don't have data on that. We don't know exactly how we would quantify that. But we do include productivity loss over a person's lifetime. So theoretically, their time and uh, income that would be part of caregiving is would be included in productivity. That's part of their productivity as an adult that, that we would be measuring. So mm -hmm. it's at least partly included. John, do you want to one last take? Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, just a comment on the blind. I wouldn't overinterpret the blindness free year stuff because you also got to remember that that's the, the bottom part of that scale. So people, there's a visual impairment that's above that. So we're not saying that they've gone from perfect sight to blindness they're spending a lot of time in the visual impairment as they're getting down to that. So so the, the, the main results you should focus on are the cost per quality. We added the, the blindness for a year to give a, a somewhat of a clinical you know, fix to, to a number, but you gotta remember that there's there's a lot of time that they're spending in that visual impairment state. The mean state is, is legal blindness when they're entering that. So it's not from perfect sight to blindness. So you just gotta sort of keep that in mind when you're trying to interpret that metric. It's very good. I'll, I'll so. also respond just briefly to the nonlinear utility. We did do a scenario for that, so you can see the results of that in the report. We chose not to use that as our base case um, because the methods for the source that we use are more closely aligned with the reference case. It's a community-based sample. Uh, we felt that those were more reliable. The nonlinear also gave a, a utility value for those people with the lowest level of blindness that's equivalent to people with a major stroke. And we, after hearing from patients, we didn't feel that that had uh, as much face validity. Right, so the, the visually impaired and blindness community didn't validate a utility measure that would be that low. Uh, qualitatively. Qualitatively, qualitatively. Okay, that's a good, that's a very good point. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next uh, section. We're slightly behind schedule, but that's okay. Um, uh, Dr. Thomas Siola, uh, uh, <coughs> Ophthalmology medical lead from Spark Therapeutics. So, <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you for coming to Kansas City to be with us today. We appreciate it. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me speak today. As you mentioned, my name is Dr. Thomas Chula, and I'm the Ophthalmology Medical Strategy Lead for Spark Therapeutics. I'm a board certified ophthalmologist and retina specialist. I co directed the retina service and ocular angiogenesis research laboratory at Indiana University School of Medicine 
and I remain a volunteer clinical professor of ophthalmology. I trained in the Harvard system, served numerous roles in over 100 national clinical trials, and have co-authored over 130 Medline Index peer-reviewed papers. I also hold an MBA and have become interested in linking my expertise in retinal disease and research with the development of novel therapies such as Luxturna that serve unmet needs. So in the next four and a half minutes, I'm going to stress three points. Number one, prior to the availability of Luxturna, nearly all patients with RPE mutation-associated retinal dystrophy would have progressed to complete blindness as there were no treatment options. Spark wants to ensure that all eligible patients have access to this novel treatment. Therefore, Spark has priced Luxturna responsibly and has created outcomes-based payer rebate arrangements that recognize its longer-term efficacy and also has explored alternative payment options that would allow for installment payments. Number two, Spark also has an interest in ensuring ISER's report in Luxturna does not limit patients' access to the therapy because of a premature base case economic model that makes headlines. As Spark has stated throughout the ISER process, the model was created too early. There are limited data available to incorporate into a model, and I think that's just been reflected. Restrictions on data have been necessary. Spark was undergoing FDA review until December 19, 2017, and is still collecting utility data. Nevertheless, Spark has worked with ISER throughout the process to improve the model and provide suggestions for the most appropriate data to include. Number three, and most importantly, Luxterna addresses a dire unmet need in a very small patient population which is impacted by ultra-rare genetic disease. This warrants appropriate inputs to determine cost effectiveness and an appropriate cost effectiveness threshold. When ISER includes some or all of these inputs as sensitivity analysis to the base case model, ISER's own report demonstrates that Luxterna is often cost effective for many patients. However, these analyses are obscured by the premature base case model that makes headlines. Let me briefly address some of these inputs and cost effectiveness thresholds individually. First, ISER's base case continues to underestimate the treatment effect from Luxterna and uses health utilities that are inappropriate for this population, as we just briefly touched on. Specifically, when ISER employs health utilities that reflect the rapid decline in health as patients progress to blindness, Luxterna appears to be cost-effective under the modified societal perspective using standard cost-effectiveness thresholds. This is shown in ISER report table 4.9. Second, even when ISER fails to use this more appropriate utility function but does incorporate both a lifetime treatment effect and indirect costs into its model, as we just touched upon, and as Spark recommends, Luxterna is indeed cost-effective at the current list price at all cost-effectiveness thresholds for a three-year-old patient and at a cost effectiveness threshold of $250,000 per quality for a 15-year-old patient. This is shown in ISER's own report, Table 4.8. Third and finally, ISER recognizes that other benefits and contextual considerations must be accounted for when reviewing an ultra-orphan drug. It therefore reports benchmark prices for higher cost effectiveness thresholds. These are more appropriate for an ultra-orphan drug like Luxterna versus more traditional drugs with larger patient populations and multiple treatment options. Therefore, Spark requests that ISER more clearly explain that when indirect costs are taken into account, as you just touched upon, even in the base case scenario, Luxterna is indeed cost effective for a three-year-old patient at the standard $150,000 per quality threshold, and for a 15-year-old patient at a $500,000 per quality threshold. So in summary, number one, Spark is addressing any potential concerns about cost directly with payers through its novel payer programs, including its outcome-based rebate arrangements that stand behind the durability of Luxterna, and potential alternative payment options that would allow for installment payments. Number two, it is disappointing that the ISER press release emphasizes only the premature base case economic model. And finally, number three, ISER's very own report demonstrates that Luxterna is indeed cost effective for many patients when it uses appropriate health utilities, uses indirect costs that address the high societal impact of blindness, as we heard today, considers a lifetime treatment effect, especially in the absence of data suggesting otherwise, and or uses higher 
cost per quality thresholds for innovative therapies addressing ultra-rare disorders, such as this one that leads to total blindness. Unfortunately, payers who do not, rev who do not review the report carefully could easily miss these points and inappropriately and unfortunately limit access to sight-saving therapy for those in need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah, so we, we thought if you're available, um, we would love to uh, ask some questions and I think build off of the, the comments that you just provided. And I think the... Could, the, I, ba could I back up just one about yeah, the MLMT? Sure. So there were some comments about the MLMT. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I want to emphasize that, um, you know, it's a novel endpoint. Um, people ask, what does it mean? Well, it turns out that it is very much grounded in reality. Um, if you look at ISA report, I think it was on page 19. Those light levels correspond to real, real world living conditions. So in other words, uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the average patient improved from 50 lux to 4 lux. So they could function at 50 lux at an outdoor train station um, and at 4 lux at an outdoor parking lot at night. So it, it actually is grounded in reality. It was an endpoint that Spark developed in conjunction with the FDA. The FDA was very, very interested in um, a, a functional vision versus visual function. So I would um, uh, state that the MLMT is indeed uh, grounded in reality. It is a real world test. That's what it was designed for. That's what the FDA wanted, a functional yeah. vision test. I think that, I appreciate that, that remark and that clarification. I think we heard, you know, kind of commentary and testimony from our, uh, from Caitlin and Janet that, that affirmed that, that particular position too. But another, another comment I'd like to clarify. Um, so there, there, there is a lot of confusion um, uh, in this um, uh, investigational um, agent uh, arena with RP65, there's, there's been two other uh, uh, studies using different vectors. And um, using those different um, therapies, um, uh, they didn't achieve the durability right. effect that we've received. Unfortunately, the results that Spark um, ha has, and for which it got approval, uh, those results are being lumped in with these other therapies. And I just want to emphasize that the therapies are totally different. You could actually have the exact same gene being augmented with the exact same vector, but they're very different therapies still. And um, they're different because, for example, uh, the Spark product removes empty capsids. Without going into all the technical detail, by removing uh, vectors that don't contain the gene, you actually uh, enhance the efficacy because you can saturate the receptors with empty capsids, and that decreases the therapeutic efficacy. We also add surfactant to the um, a product. Surfactant minimizes the, the vector from sticking to contact surfaces as it's drawn up and it goes through tubings and, and, and is injected onto the retina. Um, we have a different promoter than some of these other therapies. So to, to, to lump this therapy in with the others is not uh, scientifically accurate. And uh, our data so far um, uh, shows that there is durability. Uh, and I think in the absence uh, of, of the contrary, uh, I, I think we have to assume that there is uh, uh, durability, as, as is meant to be with any genetic therapy. And my guess is we'll get a question from the group also on maybe some additional comments on durability. But okay. Rachel, would you like to ask a question or sure. first? Sure. Thank you for your remarks. I had a question about efforts to identify patients early. We've heard how important it is for patient outcomes and quality of life to find patients and treat them early, but we've also heard from Dr. Kay and Dr. Bankin about some of the structural difficulties in identifying these patients early. I'm wondering if there are any efforts underway from Spark directly to help clinicians find these patients earlier on, or if it's merely having physicians now with greater urgency know that this treatment is available. Thanks for the question. So the question was, um, uh, what sort of efforts are underway, uh, maybe by Spark, but also the retina societies in general to identify patients earlier? Um, and so Spark uh, uh, had a program called ID Your IRD. It was a free gene testing panel, 31 genes, including this gene. Um, and it rolled out, I think, approximately a year and a half ago. It was actually greeted with great enthusiasm by the retina community. Um, unfortunately, uh, genetic testing up until now has not been something that the retina community has adopted because up until now there's been no therapy for it, and often it's not reimbursed by insurance. So I think SPARC's ID or IRD program has certainly increased awareness of genetic testing. It's becoming more and more commonplace. Dr. Kay can speak to it. She is an inherited retinal disease specialist, so she's obviously in tune to it. 
But I know in my interactions with more general retina specialists, they are now um, thinking about genetic testing. So I, I believe patients will be tested uh, more er uh, earlier as awareness increases. <clears throat> Stephen, did you have a, a remark for me? Oh, other Steve. So I, I'm David Rind. Wait, 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 sorry. From ICER. Um, I just, I, I'm intrigued.